I need to record this session. Otherwise, you cannot see it on the YouTube Thinking Sound channel afterwards. So that be, that's been taken care of. So we're going to have guest lectures every other two weeks, um, experts in their own field that are going to talk about uh, Meyer Sound technology and uh, Meyer Sound uh, ecosystem and method methodology. Um, we're also going to give you the chance to tell us what you would like us to talk about. And that means that through the Meyer Sound user community, we will uh, do a, a survey poll on Friday, this Friday to be exact. And uh, we will give you three options to choose from. And then you let us know which option you would like us to discuss. And then we'll, we'll dedicate an entire webinar to uh, discussing, uh, discussing, that, um, discussing that topic. Okay, let me fix this and um, let's continue with the um, keynote. Okay, so these uh, trainings are announced through um, the Meyer Sound um, Facebook page and um, newsletters. And um, from now on, as you've used, uh, you're used from us, um, have come to expect from us, um, we will have webinars every day at uh, 6 in the afternoon Central European time, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time in the morning. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday will be in English, whereas Tuesday and Thursday will be in Spanish. Recordings of the webinar, if I do not forget to press record, recordings of the webinars will be posted on Mario Sound's Thinking Sound YouTube channel. And currently we have enjoyed um, almost 9,000 uh, webinar views and that number is uh, steadily rising. Uh, those that are joining us on Facebook are now looking at the Facebook live stream through the Mario Sound user community group, um, which is where we stream our webinars and currently counts over 8,000 uh, members. So there you have your various options to uh, enjoy these webinars. So what is the precision tool set? Well, the precision tool set is essentially a turnkey solution for sound system design, but also remote control and monitoring the health of my system, complete with loudspeaker management systems that, as we're about to discover today, support immersive sound and spatial mixing and finally, the distribution models that allow us to distribute uh, power, uh, audio, and our proprietary RMS signal uh, through all the loudspeakers in deployment. Um, of course, the loudspeakers are at the heart of the tool set. Um, it's called the precision tool set. It's precise, it's accurate, and at the heart of it all are the loudspeakers, such as our Leo family products, Cal loudspeakers, our low frequency control elements, such as the 1100 LFC, X40, AMI studio monitors, uh, because we do cinema, we do studio post-production. Um, all of those vertical markets, markets uh, we can cater. So ultimately at the heart of it all are the loudspeakers. But in order to successfully design sound systems and deploy them and then calibrate those systems and voice them, um, we have several tools at our disposal, starting with MAP. MAP is the system design tool that we'll use to uh, design these systems and meet the demands of a particular venue. Our Galaxy platform is what we use for uh, loudspeaker management system and signal processing. And we can operate our Galaxy processors either using Compass, which is our control software, or uh, Compass Go, which is a application for the iPad, as we're about to discover. But we also want to monitor the health of our system. Um, are our loudspeakers engaging limiting? Uh, if so, we would like to know um, how much voltage and current are they drawing? And for that, we have our RMS server. Uh, which is the third pillar in the uh, precision tool set. And finally, as I already indicated, the um, power signal, audio signal, and RMS signal distribution using our MDM distribution models. Those are all the pillars together with the loudspeakers that make up for the precision tool set. And during today's session, we're going to look at uh, each of these pillars at a time, starting with uh, MAPXT. MAPXT is our proprietary prediction software. And uh, it has several key features that I would like to discuss with you. Um, for starters, it has unprecedented high resolution uh, for sound field predictions of energy distribution in the horizontal and in the vertical plane. Uh, it will show you uh, headroom and SPL data in such a way that you are assured that your loudspeaker is still within its linear range of operation. So it gives you the, um, it gives you the potential, uh, potential headroom knowing in advance that um, loudspeakers will not be distorting. 
Um, it will show you frequency response, which consists of two parts. There's the amplitude response and there's the so-called um, uh, phase uh, response and together they constitute the frequency response. Then there is the IFT, IFFT, which is an abbreviation for, in, for inverse Fourier, uh, fast Fourier transform, IFFT, and, but colloquially it's referred to as simply impulse response. However, it's calculated out of the transfer function. It's a second generation transfer function, if you will. MAP supports multiple loudspeakers, arrays, as well as measurement microphones, which we can position at our discretion. And we can organize all of that in layers, which we can give colors and so on and so forth. So we can organize all our microphones, loudspeakers, arrays, so on and so forth. We can organize that in a very manageable uh, layer system. Autosplay is something that we already discussed in uh, previous webinars. And the same goes for importing the um, CAD files or the so-called computer-aided drawing files, uh, more particular, the um, drawing exchange file data file format. And this was uh, discussed at great length in previous webinars. And finally, within MAP, we have all the same processing at our disposal as we would have in the real world using our Galaxy, uh, Galileo Galaxy devices. So you have your LMBC, you have your delay integration, um, all of those features are there for you um, to play with. And um, this precision that I mentioned early relates to data acquisition because Myersound in 95 built its own anechoic room. And that means that the predictions in MAP are derived of data that we obtained in-house using our own anechoic room. Um, in the anechoic room is a loudspeaker positioner, as we're about to see, uh, that has less than one degree uh, accuracy. So it can rotate loudspeakers in various um, axes, along various axes, very, very precise in less than one degree steps. And that means that the polar files that we um, measure ourselves consist of both amplitude and phase data, as we're about to discover. And finally, there's a procedure which we've been using for decades that allows us to determine the maximum linear SPL and headroom data for these loudspeakers. And all of that information, the procedure, is disclosed on mnoise.org, which is where we show uh, the procedure and how we apply it using a excitation signal that is a better approximation of actual music, the ultimate program content that most of us will end up enjoying or if you go to the cinema, um, the a soundtrack that you will end up enjoying, uh, the score of a particular movie. Um, so that procedure you can find on mnoise.org and it will ensure that your loudspeaker will stay within its linear uh, range of operation as long as you respect the maximum speed limit, as I like to call it. So um, here we see that positioner. Uh, that positioner uh, is currently holding a device under test, or D uh, DUT. Um, it's holding it with help of a position arm, and that position arm uh, is attached to two servo motors. There's one at the base of the arm, and then there's one directly behind the loudspeaker, which allows you to spin the loudspeaker at least in two axes, as we're about to discover. The measurement microphone in the anechoic room is stationary, which means that we rotate the loudspeaker around a certain center of rotation during measurement, but the measurement microphone itself is stationary, which helps us eliminate measurement errors. So this is a very uh, vintage, for lack of a better description, vintage um, uh, computer-generated um, uh, video fragment where, you, uh, where we're about to enter the anechoic room and the um, camera is about to swivel and then we will actually see the positioner sitting over there in front of the door that is about to close and over there you have a Meyer sound loudspeaker being held by the positioner mounted to the positioner and you can see that we can rotate it in the um, in the horizontal axis but we can also rotate it in the vertical axis and that allows us to measure this loudspeaker with great 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 accuracy um that being said map as we know it um is 2d and that means that we briefly need to talk about so-called drawing planes um there's three drawing planes um, that we typically talk about. If you observe a design from above, we refer to that as a plan view, whereas if you're interested in a cross section, then we refer to that as a section view. And uh, sometimes you might also have a reason to look at a transection view, which is, uh, you can think of that as observing the stage from front of house or um, the other way around, observing front of house from the stage, if you will. 
And that means that when we obtain our polar data in that anechoic room that you just saw, that we do so in the horizontal plane or plan view, and we do so in the uh, vertical plane or section view. Um, and we do that in 360 steps. So we orbit the loudspeaker, that is to say the microphone remains stationary, but we rotate during measurement the loudspeaker in 360 degree steps. And each measurement consists of 48 points per octave. That is the resolution. And that means that in the uh, barely 10 audible octaves, we're looking at roughly 480 uh, frequency uh, points, if you will. So that is a large, uh, these are a lot of data points. This is a lot of data that we're dealing with, both in the horizontal and in the vertical. But what we get in exchange for that is unprecedented accuracy and precision, every one degree a measurement with a frequency resolution of 48 points um, per octave. The trade-off for this resolution is that from a historical perspective, when MAP Online was launched in 1998, that it required a patented client server method for processing these huge calculations remotely, which is still used today. Um, but rest assured, we're approaching the end of an era and all of this is about to change in the foreseeable future. But until today, we do the number crunching remote because of the high resolution and the huge data files that, um, that um, causes or the, the, the number, the sheer number of data points. And that is why we have to go online to do so. Okay. Um, since it's a 2D prediction, that means that there are some constraints um, and that it relates to what we call loudspeaker propagation planes. Which loudspeakers can we predict within the MAP software and which loudspeaker do we, can, can we not predict within the um, MAP software? Okay, on the left-hand side, we see an example of a vertical array. These are three X40s that are uh, arrayed below each other um, with 15-degree inter-element angles, as it's known. But the loudspeaker that we see in MAP is the loudspeaker whose propagation plane runs parallel to the drawing plane. So in plan view, you're looking at your, at your venue from above, and then you see the loudspeaker whose uh, propagation plane runs level to the drawing plane. We talked about this at great length in the down tilt translation webinar. Whereas on the right hand side we have a horizontal array where our X40s are not deployed beneath underneath each other but have been deployed in a horizontal array and that means that the loudspeaker that we end up seeing in section view, which is when we observe the room from the side, that is again the loudspeaker that is facing dead ahead whose propagation plane runs parallel to the drawing plane. And that means that um, in these two scenarios, the loudspeakers that I've colored red are the loudspeakers that will not show up in a prediction. You will only see those loudspeakers whose propagation plane runs parallel to the drawing plane. Okay. Um, in down tilt translation webinar that you will find on YouTube, we talked about this at great length and showed that it's not an insurmountable problem. And um, once you stitch your section view and your plan view together um, using SketchUp in this case, it suddenly all makes a lot of sense and it's not so, uh, it's not so complicated as, is, uh, as, as one would think. Um, you just need to be mindful of the um, restraints, the constraints. Okay. So, as I said before, MAPXT gives us a high resolution data, uh, uh, actionable data, uh, data that allows you to design a system uh, knowing that it will meet your expectations. And that means that we have accurate sound field predictions in the top left corner. Um, we use so-called jet colors where red is hot as in loud and blue is cold as in soft. But at the same time, uh, MAP will also uh, show you band spectra, and those band spectra are interesting because they show you headroom as a bar graph, and they will also show you uh, average and peak SPL, depending on which excitation signal you use. And we give you three different metrics, performance metrics, um, to make an informed decision, which is your conventional pink noise, but then there's also B noise, and there is even music noise or M noise. Um, as of uh, last year. However, it doesn't stop there. We also show you the frequency response and not just the amplitude portion, but also the um, phase portion, which is equally important, uh, if not more important, because that's what delay integration and product integration is all about, which we discussed in a previous webinar.
And as was promised, we will also show you the IFFT, or Inverse Fast Fourier Transform, colloquially referred to as impulse response, which allows you to time align loudspeakers within your sound system design tool called MapXT. So um, how does that work in practice? Well, over here we have a loudspeaker. Um, and this loudspeaker has a laser protruding out it. We call that a center line. And we have a line known as a visual architectural aid at ear height, which represents the ears of our spectators. And we can do a prediction. In this case, I've done a one octave wide prediction centered at four kilohertz. And then we see the energy distribution in the sound field. Mind you, we're looking at the section view. So we're looking at the propagation plane in the vertical. And then we see that all these um, listeners are you know, perfectly fine, everything. I could, couldn't be more happy, happy as a clam in high tide. Um, Friday, I will be talking at great length about MapXT because Friday's webinar will be an introduction to MapXT. But it doesn't stop there. Um, we can also introduce an LFC, which stands for low frequency control or um, colloquially referred to as a subwoofer. And then we can even introduce a microphone in our sound field. And that allows us to look at data that you're used at looking, you know, most of you are used to look at in your uh, dual channel FFT analyzers such as SIM and SMART. So we show you the same data that you actually would expect to see in the field. And all of that is there in MAP for you uh, to play with. As we've already seen in previous webinars, MAP also has uh, two features, um, not limited to, there are many more which we are about to discover in the next webinar, but two more features worth mentioning, which is the auto display design assist and the possibility to import uh, CAD drawings, so-called computer-aided drawings, uh, more specifically in the uh, drawing exchange file. So that is MAP, that is our design tool. But then, sooner or later, we need to deploy the system and calibrate and voice the system, and that's where our Galaxy platform comes into the equation, as well as the Compass Control software and Compass Go, which allows you to walk the room while listening to the sound system. Okay, so what is Galaxy? Galaxy is a, a signal processing platform, and uh, several of its core key features are that we uh, primarily use it for uh, uh, calibration or tuning and voicing or toning a, as a conventional loudspeaker management system or LMS. Okay, I'm going to hit pause because we have a question from Amit. Okay, Amit, please use the chat and um, I'll try to answer your question to the best of my ability. When can we see M noise reading in the headroom windows? Well, it's already there. Last time that I looked, it's already there. Uh, but in the drop down menu, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. In the drop down menu, which is not shown over here, okay? Um, so you know what? Hold that thought, and hopefully you can make it next Friday, and then I'll be sure to show you where you can find the M noise reading. It does live in the data sheets of uh, our products, which you can download at the website. So hopefully that question will do uh, for now. Okay, so Galaxy platform. We use it primarily as loudspeaker management system for calibration or tuning and voicing, also known as toning purposes. But it doesn't end there. Um, it supports AVB and is Milan certified. It features proprietary, proprietary processing techniques such as U-shaping, product integration, and LMBC. It allows you to store snapshots both locally on each device itself, but also globally in one go, as we saw during Oscar Barrientos, Barrientos webinar um, called Compass Global View. And it has a very, very uh, powerful 32 by 16 summing and delay matrix. So at the cross points, we can not only set level, but at the cross points, we can also uh, introduce delay as we're about to discover. And this powerful matrix makes it possible to uh, launch Space Map Go, which is a solution that allows for immersive sound as well as spatial mixing on existing Galaxy platforms, as we're about to discover during the uh, course of today's uh, webinar. Um, I see another question on the chat. Um, what is U-shaping? U-shaping can be thought of as multiband EQ, but it has extra bells and whistles, which we are about to discover at the beginning of next week when we do an introduction to Compass. Okay, 
Um, we can also link channels, as we saw in Oscar's webinar. And uh, we can do that again locally, uh, linking channels at the uh, device level locally, or uh, link several channels across several uh, galaxies globally. And finally, the Galaxy platform allows you to approach it with multiple clients, which means I can have Compass control software running and at the same time walk the room using my iPad with Compass Go and in the near future even access uh, approach Galaxy platform using uh, Space Map Go. Uh, immersive platform that allows also for spatial mixing as we're about to discover. Very versatile. Okay, so Galaxy models come in three flavors. There's the 408, there's the 816 AES 3, and there's the 816, which is basically the um, input and output capability as we're about to discover. Over here you see the front panels and the rear panels and you can tell that the 816 has 16 output XLRs and has uh, 8 input in XLRs whereas the Galaxy 408 on the right hand side only has 8 output XLRs and 4 input XLRs, hence uh, Galaxy 408. So what are the differences? Well the differences I already said is primarily I.O. capability. At the top right screen, we have our 408, followed by our 816, and ultimately our 816 AS3. Um, the inputs shown by the uh, pink um, bounding box, those are my four analog inputs. And two of them, indicated by the yellow bound, bounding box, two of those XLR inputs also double as AS inputs. So that's where I can insert my AS3 format signal, which is two channels, hence only two digital inputs, whereas four analog inputs. And then to the right of it, we have our eight analog outputs within the green um, bounding box. Um, since um, Galaxy devices are uh, AVB, um, support AVB and are Milan certified, of course we have two EtherCon connectors that allow for primary and secondary um, AVB connections. On the chat we see, um, is Galaxy SIM compatible? Yes, SIM compatible, because to the left, not part of this webinar, but to the left you can already see the so-called SIM bus connector, and uh, barely readable below that is the SIM, which is where we attach our SIM bus cable, which I've come to call the umbilical cord, that connects the Galaxy processor to the um, SIM machine. So there's your 408. Now, what makes the 816 different? Well, it has twice the amount of inputs and it has twice the amount of outputs. And then finally, there's the AES uh, 3 version. And what, it, what sets it apart from the 816 is that it has eight analog outputs living on outputs 9 through 16. But on top of that, it also has eight AES outputs living on physical connectors 1 through 8. Now, I would like to remind you that those AES 3 format connections are dual channels. So now we can, uh, we can put out 16 channels of digital audio using only 8 connectors. And finally, the AES 3 version has a word clock connection for uh, timing critical applications. But it doesn't stop there. If we go to the table on the left hand side, we see that our 408 has four analog inputs, but can be expanded by using four AVB inputs, making it eight inputs in total, of which four can be analog. But since the Galaxy platform supports AVB, it has an additional 24 inputs that directly feed the matrix, hence 32 inputs in total. And that goes for all Galaxy models, regardless whether you have a 408, an 816, or 816 AS, at all times you have 32 inputs in total. And the same is true for outputs. You have 16 outputs regardless of the model. So you have the 32 by 16 matrix, which makes Space Map Go a possibility on all of these devices, as we're about to discover. Okay. So, how do we control our Galaxy processors? Well, for that we use the Compass control software. And Compass is basically tab-based. Now, what do I mean by tab-based? It's basically a collection of tabs that each serve a purpose. On the left-hand side, we are in the so-called overview tab, which, is, uh, which gives you a bird-eye perspective of what is going on within your Galaxy device. And currently, we're looking at the product integration dialog, which allows me to make the loudspeaker's face compliant. It's a proprietary processing that will make sure that all those different loudspeakers from different face curve families ultimately end up having the same face curve. If you want to know more about that, please watch the product integration webinar on YouTube. On the right hand side, we see a different top 
This is the low mid beam control top, which allows us to spread the beam for curvilinear rays or allows us to tilt the beam for curvilinear rays. And all of that happens from the compass control software. But it doesn't stop there. Compass also allows me to control a Cal column loudspeaker with beam steering. It allows me to uh, assign inputs. Do I want to use analog inputs? Do I want to use the AVB inputs? It allows me to control the beam, which means that I can change the tilt of the beam. I can change the spread of the beam. And for the larger CAL models, such as the 64 and the 96, I can actually split the beam, which uh, offers uh, very interesting uh, possibilities. But we'll discuss that in the CAL week during the course of this webinar series. Uh, it allows me to do my processing, uh, parametric EQ, so on and so forth, uh, monitor the health of my CAL loudspeakers using RMS, remote monitoring system, and store all of that in um, presets that can be recalled. Okay. Compass also allows me to monitor the health of the entire sound system provided I have an RMS server within my system, as we're about to discover. But should I have an RMS server within my system, then I can create multiple user-defined taps that allow me to monitor the health and status of my loudspeakers. I can mute them, I can solo them, I can wing them, I can see how much current is being drawn, volts through power consumption, so on and so forth, and all of that happens within the Compass control software. We can make groups by going through the group stop, which again allows us to create multiple user-defined taps. And this allows me to group inputs and outputs across multiple devices and mute them or unmute them with the clink, click of a single button. Um, we can save those groups and recall them later as, um, as groups or as individual groups. And then there's the control stop within the same Compass software, which again allows you to create multiple user-defined taps where I can add control points such as gain, mute, delay, EQ bypass, and graphical user interface elements such as your EQ plot, uh, metering, U-shaping, and even add background images, which would allow me to place those controls where we see the loudspeakers, for example. And it has three modes, which is, of course, your layout, as you lay out your user-defined taps, and then you can configure them with the proper control points and parameters. And finally, the, um, the operate mode, where everything comes to life in Compass. However, sometimes you might want to walk the room while listening to the sound system and making tweaking, tweak, tweak the sound system or make snapshots and so forth while walking the room. And for this, we created um, Compass Go, which is an uh, application that you can download from the, um, I, um, from the App Store and runs on your iPad and iOS devices. And um, it has uh, access to a subset of control points of the larger uh, Galaxy, uh, the larger Compass uh, control software. Compass Go has access to a subset of that, but very powerful because it will still allow you to uh, adjust delay, gain, mute, manage your U-shaping, your product integration, parametric EQ, see the current status of parameters, and make real-time adjustments to those control points. You can recall strap snapshots uh, or prior user settings that you made, create new snapshots uh, at the individual processors and move about freely with your iPad to analyze array coverage, for example, and sound quality from different seating locations without being stuck to your office. And by office, I mean the front of house position. So in the Meyer Sound ecosystem using galaxies, how would channel management go? Say that we look at a very simplified example. Suppose that I have a left and a right signal feed coming out of a mixing console that has to go to an array living on the left and a curvilinear array living on the right, uh, house right, house left, um, together with subwoofers. Imagine that the array loudspeakers are daisy chain and so goes for the subwoofers. Well, then I have uh, two physical inputs, four physical outputs that I need. And in Compass, in the overview tab, which is the bird eye perspective, that would look as followed. We have uh, channels A and B, which uh, have the left and uh, right input signals. And um, in our summing matrix, we assign those inputs to four outputs. Uh, two of those go to the array, and two of those go to the, um, to the subwoofers. And um, setting those cross points in the summing matrix, as we call it, is done by going to the summing matrix top. And the summing matrix top will always show you your inputs on the left-hand side in a column, and it will show your outputs as a row. And uh, as we discovered earlier, there's always 16 outputs, regardless the model of Galaxy device that you use, and there's always 32 inputs for you to choose from. 
uh, 24 of those will be AVB signals. And this is where we connect or link our in and outputs together, and we can set the gain at every individual cross point. So um, where an input meets an output, we call it a cross point, and there we can set a gain. And not just gain, but also a delay if we desire to do so, which we'll discover uh, early next week. Um, so for example, in Roskilde, where sound systems tend to get really big, um, it is very common to use multiple Galaxy devices uh, and do it in a redundant fashion. So at the front of house, we have what we refer to as our master Galaxy. That is the ingress point for the different stems coming out of the mixing console. Could be left, right, uh, it could be center channel, could be subwoofer feet, um, it could be a separate feed for front fills, so on and so forth. So we have a master Galaxy leaving at the front of house, and then completely redundant with a primary and a secondary network, we go to two switches, and from those switches, we can go to all other Galaxy devices that are distributed throughout the sound system. Some of them could live near the stage, uh, some of them could live near the relay or delay towers, and Oscar Barrientos did a great webinar already on that called Compass Global View. Which brings us to Space Map Go. Very exciting stuff, Space Map Go, as we're about to see. Because here's the deal. Anyone that owns a Galaxy now will have access to immersive sound and spatial mixing. As we speak, there are over 4,000 Galaxy units around the world. And in the near future, Space Map Go, which is an iPad application, will be released. And it works as follows. Imagine you have a mixing console and you feed a Pro Tools session, multiple stems into your mixing console or microphones, if you will. Then you feed that through AVB to your Galileo Galaxy uh, platform, which has, um, has uh, the firmware running required for SpaceMap Go. And that allows me to send 32 channels through, through AVB from my mixing console to a Galileo Galaxy, regardless whether it's an 816 or 416, which I can then approach through a wireless network using iPad. And iPad will have the Space Map Go app, which is a super intuitive app that does not require any technological proficiency in operating an iPad. It's, uh, it's an artistic tool and uh, it's like riding a bike, um, very straightforward. Out of a single Galaxy comes 16 outputs, which we can then feed to the loudspeakers in our immersive sound system or spatial mixing. And SpaceMap Go will support up to as much as four galaxies. And uh, that means that uh, regardless whether we use 408 or 816s, we have up to 32 inputs with help of AVB plus the analog inputs, uh, hardware inputs that live on those devices. And that gives us 64, four times 16, 64 outputs to play with. So now we have a 32 by 64 matrix, if you will, which gives uh, which gives a lot of opportunities. And we can operate that using the Space Map Go app uh, using multiple iPads at once, as I already disclosed uh, earlier today. And Space Map Go offers support for popular digital audio workstations, but also applications such as QLab, and plugins are being developed as we speak, which can run on consoles. And this is being launched uh, in the near future. Very exciting stuff. We showed this uh, during ISC 2020 at our demo room, and there we used two galaxies to have a space map system um, using 13, 19, uh, and then 12. So that is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 90 plus 12, that's about 31 speakers in total, um, give or take. And um, we had seven X40s distributed uh, across the front, and then we had uh, six X20s as surrounds, and then we had pods, as we call them, each containing uh, three UPM 1Ps. We had four of those as overheads, and all of that was operated with an iPad and two Galaxy processors. So very exciting stuff, uh, looking forward to that. Then, as promised, another pillar of the toolset is the so-called RM server. What is an RM server? Well, in general, it's the central hardware component in a Compass remote monitoring system. And it allows us to enable the status of a loudspeaker and its health from within Compass, as we already saw earlier. It uses a so-called Echelon FT10 network protocol, which supports mixed and star network topologies. And it's compatible with all loudspeakers that are equipped with RMS modules, and RMS modules can be added later. So there is no obligation to start 
with loudspeakers that have RMS modules, you can add those uh, at a later stage. When you have an RMS system uh, server in your ecosystem, you can monitor up to 50 nodes, um, where a node could be a, an actual physical loudspeaker, uh, which houses an RMS module, or it could be uh, one of our MPS uh, power supplies from the Intelligent DC range. And we have an entire focus week dedicated on Intelligent DC, so uh, rest assured we will discuss that at great length. Once I have an RMS server in my ecosystem, I can monitor voltage, current, the, uh, uh, the onset of limiting, uh, the temperature. Are my loudspeakers online or offline? I can mute the loudspeakers at the loudspeaker level. I can solo them. I can wink to make sure that we have a connection. And I can do that in groups or I can do that individually. There's the option to trigger, uh, to trigger external third-party devices uh, via relay outputs for voice evacuation purposes and such. And the RMS server will send you emails um, through its internal mail server if there are uh, issues uh, that are worth addressing. So what do I need? Um, well, I need a compass, a computer running the compass control server, and I need a, an RM server. And that RM server will connect through twisted pair cable uh, through my uh, Leo family products, uh, or more generally to all loudspeakers that feature an RS, RMS module, or in the Intelligent DC range to, uh, to the MPS power supply uh, units. So here you see a very simple example of such an application where we have a single RMS server that is connected via Belden A205 cable to one loudspeaker and then it's simply daisy chained to a second loudspeaker which also has an RMS module. And to have access to the RMS server, um, we use uh, the Compass uh, software. We're going to talk about RM server uh, during one of the um, later webinars in the weeks to come. Recommended cable should be 500 meter at most, uh, wire gauge 20, uh, stranded unshielded, and um, the nice thing is that what I like to call it's idiot proof, which means it doesn't matter how you wire the plus and the minus. Um, Obviously, when you uh, reduce the um, cable uh, gauge, then you uh, sacrifice length. So that is something uh, to be mindful of. So once I have an RMS server in my ecosystem, uh, I can uh, go to the RMS top in Compass, and it will show me all these interesting metrics, such as current consumption, power consumption, voltage consumption, are the limiters engaging, what is the temperature doing, and I can show that um, I can show that as meters, which go left to right or up to down, uh, or I can show it simply as loudspeaker icons, where green is cool and red is not such a good idea. Okay, and then it will even show you very specific information such as uh, peak values and so on and so forth, uh, very often for all the amplifier channels in a particular product. But we're going to talk about that at a later stage. Which finally brings us to our distribution models, because we've looked at designing our system using MAP. We've talked about um, how do we manage those systems using Galaxy, which uh, takes care of the... Uh, um, the calibration or tuning and the voicing or toning. Uh, we looked at monitoring the health of a system, but what about distributing my power, uh, audio, and RMS signals through the loudspeakers? For that, we have our distribution models, the MDMs. MDMs come in two flavors. There's the 832 model and there's the 5000 model. I propose we look at the 5000 model first. It comes in two uh, versions. There's a version that is uh, designed for the US and then there's a version that is uh, designed for the European Union. Um, the front panel in both cases is the same and there are two, um, there are two multi-core connectors. One is for AC, one is for alternating current and the other one is for audio as we're about to uh, discover. Uh, there's a lot of accessories that come with the MDM which are, uh, which are uh, um, which will integrate in your existing cable stock. Um, there's breakouts with um, you know, cables of same length or cables of different lengths, um, many, many options. And um, this is basically the workflow. Uh, we have a Soka PAX 19P that takes care of all power requirements and runs parallel to the power cons on the front panel. Then we have uh, a LK37, which has my inclinometer or inclinometer signal, it has uh, my RMS signal if I desire to do so, and of course it has my audio signals all in one convenient multi-core cable. Um, 
that being said, uh, on the front panel, I have individual RMS uh, um, connectors using the so-called white Muller connector. Or if I have loudspeakers that are outfitted with the five pin connector, then I have two extra pins for my RMS signal in one convenient uh, cable rather than having a, dead, a, a separate white Muller connector and, and a conventional uh, audio cable. So with five pins, you save yourself. Um, you save yourself a cable. <clears throat> Okay, so we have our power going out of the Socopex, we have our audio signal, our RMS, and our inclinometer living on an LK37. And uh, that means that uh, together with the MDM system, with the 5000 series, there's the so-called MDM calculator, which allows me to calculate the load for a particular system based on the line voltage, which is uh, depending on where you live in the world, uh, the cable gauge, and the quantity of loudspeakers and what model that I'm using. And in exchange for all that information, you will get the load per phase as well as per branch, and it will tell you the total generator load so that you can request a appropriate generator to drive your sound system. And this is how a deployment could look like. Um, in the top left corner, we have our Galaxy device. We're using uh, six analog outputs, feeding uh, six analog inputs, and internally that will be fed to the LK cable, which um, sends the signal through our array up in the air and has an extra channel um, that is intended for the inclinometer. Um, and then the other cable takes care of all your power needs, which is the Socopex cable, which has all your uh, power con connectors and that is how you would wire a system. This is just one of uh, many, many examples. And that basically brings us uh, to the end of today's webinar, uh, where we looked at the tool set. And um, we will uh, use this tool set time and again um, in the weeks to come. You know, we'll use MAP for designing the system. We will look at how to work with those systems in Galaxy and in Compass, um, and uh, followed up by case studies of real world um, examples. Almost there. There is another MDM which is the A32 and that is for example uh, a device which is very uh, nice to have in a monitor environment. Uh, again uh, it has both 3-pin and 5-pin versions uh, depending on how you want to distribute your RMS signals and then using uh, conventional composite cables I can send both my audio RMS signals as well as my power signal uh, through one and the same cable and uh, in monitor world this is a very uh, popular solution. Okay, that brings us basically to the end of this introduction to the tool set and that means that um, thankfully I hit record on time that means that the recording of uh, today's session will be uploaded to YouTube uh, Thinking Sound. I made a, a typo um, now is the good time to notice that. Um, made a typo. Okay, regardless. This is going to be uploaded to the um, Thinking Sound channel on YouTube, um, where we currently have almost 9,000 total webinar views, a number uh, which is rising. As for the next webinar, that will be uh, this Friday. And this Friday, we will start with an introduction to MAP, showing you the base functionality of MAP, because MAP is the starting point for many designs. Uh, using accurate data, using precise uh, data. And that concludes uh, today's presentation, which um, leads me to thank you for your attendance and hopefully we'll get to see uh, each other um, this Friday. And um, that means that I'm more than happy to um, spend another couple of minutes to uh, answer any questions you might have uh, to the best of my abilities. So if you would like to ask questions, uh, please use the uh, chat box so that I can answer your questions uh, to the best of my abilities. Where can we download the uh, MDM software? Um, okay, let me open up a browser and, um, and show you where this, uh, where this will uh, live. Are you going to make a webinar about LMBC? Uh, in time, LMBC will be covered, um, will be covered um, during uh, later, later um, weeks, later courses uh, during this week.
Okay, I have to look more in depth for the MDM calculator. Here's what I propose. I'm gonna put the link to the MDM calculator. I'm gonna put that in the comments on the YouTube video um, once this has been uploaded to the web. Any other questions at this point? Okay. It appears that the chat is cooling down. In which case, uh, I would like to thank you once more for attending today's webinar. And I hope to see you on Friday. Stay safe and uh, stay healthy.